Yes, my name is Sabita Sudama from the Netherlands. Um, I had a question. I found all talks excellent. Thank you for that. I had a question for John. Um, I was wondering, uh, because you showed a lot of data on the 100% fruit juice, and actually uh, what we are uh, buying in the supermarkets is usually not 100%. So if you had any idea on how those associations are, that's my first question. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question, and, and not all of the cohorts report that well or are able to differentiate it. Where they did, we did include that. So you saw for diabetes, I think, gave us the best differentiation. We had sugar sweet beverages, fruit drinks, mixed fruit drinks. These are where they add juice and then they put added sugars, and then the ones that were clearly 100% fruit juice. And you yeah. saw that the fruit drinks and the mixed fruit drinks behaved more like the sugar sweetened beverages, whereas the 100% fruit juice showed the yeah. neutral association. Well, that, that's what we saw for, for the others where it was where it was available, but we didn't, it, it, it's a real issue with the, the dietary instruments, being able to differentiate those and having that reported well, and being able to yeah. actually show that, yeah. Yeah, so if we bring out this message to the public, then they don't really, uh, I think, uh, differentiate between they, fruit juice is fruit juice. So I think that's, that distinction is quite important. Uh, uh, no, I think you're right, and, and Jordy mentioned that too, that uh, yeah. it, with the, their FFQ, uh, they they had found that experience, and I and I'd seen another survey that most uh, people could not, I think, accurately uh, describe but what they were having. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, as related great. to fruit and fruit juice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, my other question relates to, if I may, um, to solid versus liquids, because um, as I understand, peeling an orange takes more effort, is more satiating, and then uh, you probably consume less calories the rest of the day, whereas the orange juice has more oranges in it and is liquid. And did you do any studies with satiation? And do, what do you think of this theory? <laughs> so we didn't look at this, but I mean, this has been well reviewed. I mean, I think Jordy yeah. showed some of that data and I'll let him comment, but I know that um, it's been well reviewed, certainly preload studies with a bet liquid form, semi-solids and solids showing yeah. the liquid calories are more poorly compensated, so I think that's been well described, and I know Jordy had that. Yeah, well, you showed that crossover trial. I have shown yeah. one of yeah. the articles, yeah. but there are other articles showing the same. So this is uh, one of the theories that can explain uh, that uh, in case of uh, fruit juices, uh, uh, there is no association, or in some cases, an association with uh, an increase in body weight is the same as the sh sugar uh, sweetened beverages. Yeah, thank you. Jenny. Um, as a food scientist by training, I'd just like to make a comment. Um, we all learn as students that fruits can vary in sugar content from, say, 8% to 12% sugars. So oranges, apples, they all vary biologically from year to year, depending on light and sun and the position on the tree, etc., etc. So when they make the fruit juice, they tend to say, okay, this is 100% fruit juice, but by law, they're allowed to add sugars. So in years where there are only 8% sugars, they can add up to 4% more to make it sweeter so that the consumer is getting a reliably, you know, product that they can, they know that they will like. So. Does it really matter whether nature created a 12% or you, you added another four grams? Does it really matter? It's got the same phytonutrients, it's got the same vitamins. So I think I just would like to be, be a little bit more scientific. Does it matter? <laughs> I agree, Jenny. I'm not sure it does. And I think that the distinction you're seeing is with some of the fruit drinks, they may only have 10% fruit juice in them and, and the rest is flavor and color. and so. I think in the, in the case you're describing, I mean, the nutrients are there, all the phytochemicals, the bioactives, all those things, uh, the potassium that may be contributing to these benefits that we're seeing. So that difference probably doesn't matter. And those are the ones that are actually captured in the FFQs anyways, because people are in the real world consuming those products. So The problem is that the public in general do not understand what these 100% fruit juices or another fruit juices bottled with added sugar. This is the problem. There is a perception, especially for in Spain, I suppose that in other countries it's the same, uh, that for the breakfast, the, the mother and the father, they recommend to the children to consume fruit 
bottled fruit because they perceive that this is good for health because it's fruit, okay? And this is, a, this is a, <coughs> an important problem because uh, they consume more sugar uh, with this type of uh, bottled fruit. Cheers. Okay, Professor. Kati Lambros from Greece, thank you very much. I would like to uh, ask two questions to the last speaker, uh, Andrea. Um, the first one is if we have data about the benefits of fruits to those who already have at least initial cardiovascular disease. And the second question, uh, rather comment, is um, very often the fruit juices are in bottles from the industry. And uh, do we know if we leave open the bottle for a few days, because you cannot drink always the whole of the bottle, uh, what happens with the rest in terms of chemical um, changes, especially the durability, durability of antioxidants? Uh, thank you. So in regards to the first question, there is some data that we came across that was on secondary prevention, so ones that already have had a CVD event that we didn't look into further when we saw that. Um, so there, there is data out there for fruits and people that have already had, um, have already indicated to have a cardiovascular disease, but I didn't look into it any further than that. Um, and then for, we excluded those, yeah, we only include people that were um, free of CVD at baseline. And um, and then in terms of the second question. The bottle. Yes, the bottle question. I'm not really sure how to answer that. If anybody else has uh, any comment on it, if there's, if you leave the fruit juice bottle open, I wouldn't expect there to be, to be a change, but. No, the, the problem of the bottle uh, fruit juices is that they are a very range of different types of, uh, of, of, of this type of uh, drink, so. In some cases, uh, there are a lot of uh, sugar in some cases, but also uh, there are some other chemicals, no, yeah, and additives, etc. I and do we, not we mean cannot, added cannot sugar. I mean juice. And, and, and juice. also, there is a loss of bioactives uh, when it's bot bottled. So you, you know it's, it's that. not the same. So the problem it, for it me has been described. You know that, or yeah. you guess. Only is it a guess or a statement? No, no, I, I, do, I don't have the, the data in relation to this. I, I have some data in relation to the, to, to the sugar added in, in Spain. So there are diff, uh, uh, a lot of differences between some uh, content in relation to the bottled uh, uh, fruit juices. So the, but the problem is the same. Eh? For me, the problem is the message for the population. So if you say fruit juices is good for health because uh, rich in fruit, the problem is that you are recommending adding sugar to your, to your diet. So, okay. And the perception of people is that in general, especially in, in Spain, for, 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 for the fathers and the mothers of, of children is that that uh, fruit juices are good for health, good for the prevention of obesity, good for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. So, and they recommend this for the breakfast, especially in, in Spain. So all the children came with the I with agree the to the comment of, to my comment. Thank you. I just got to make a quick comment on that. You mentioned glass bottles, presumably. And I think that's a good one. Um, I think probably more important may be the difference between glass and plastic. Oh, yes. And I think that there one has the problem with all sorts of leaching of plasticizers out of the plastics, which we're now using more and more. And to, 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 to cover Jim's point earlier on, I think the environmental issue is a catastrophe in terms of the single-use plastic. For the whole humanity in general. Thank you. Tom. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment about the previous discussion about the variation of apple co composition. Uh, one of the things that surprised me was if you look at international GI tables, the GI of apples is very consistent. It's one of the least variable 
And I can't imagine that people doing that are actually measuring the composition of apples they're using food tables. So, and this is around the world in different years and everything. So it's very, probably doesn't matter much. It doesn't matter much. No. <laughs> and it seems to be a misconception that fruit has a lower glycemic index than fruit juice, when as David showed, it's actually the difference is really small. And when you think about it, what our teeth do, our teeth have got the most incredible processing pr pressure capability that's better than anything that you've got in the food industry. Uh, Annette, please. Uh, and at Buchan University of Paderborn. I just have a question in relation to the energy intake adjustment because I think that that was a, the main issue with fruit juice is that we think it's similar to soft drinks that it contributes to excess energy. And I had the feeling that it's not always taken into account correctly. Sometimes it's just energy in total, whereas there were would need to be energy from other sources that you need to adjust for. So do you have you had the possibility to look into that and perhaps look at the studies that did it properly and whether that made any difference? That's my question. And just a comment, in terms of polyphenols, flavonoids, they are quite, um, um, they, they often are quite going substantially down if you have the bottle open. So and when we're looking at that, at polyphenols in terms of a health benefit, I think uh, the point that was made earlier does apply then. So uh, two answers, I guess. Well, first of all, in terms of the prospective cohorts, we took the most adjusted models. So uh, some investigators will adjust for energy. Others won't because it's on the causal pathway between the exposure and the outcome, and so they rationalize not adjusting. So it is a mix, a mix of models, but that's the best we have. Uh, and it, I have to tell you, it's not generally well described, so well described that I could give you that level of granularity. Uh, and then in terms of the trials, there's actually not many uh, that have looked at fruit juice where the comparator is a non-sugar comparator. Uh, we only had, I think, one for fruit juice and, and a couple for dried fruit. Um, and those, those were matched, the isochloric, or there was an ad libitum uh, trial as well where uh, it was free replacement and we still saw the reduction and David showed that more clearly because he had those data to show. So I think, um, I mean, I think where we have it in the trials, there's not a lot of data, but I mean, the energy adjustment is, is the overall diet and, it, and it's showing that it's not, uh, in that context, it's, it's actually reducing blood pressure, uh, what David showed. No, one, one thing uh, in order to add in relation to this, in, in case of, uh, of uh, cohort studies, prospective studies, when we are looking in the association between sugar drinks or fruit, con uh, or fruit juices consumption and diabetes, in, in some cases, authors uh, adjust for energy. And I think I, this is not correct. Because, because if the theory is that you increase, yes, yeah, in the causal pattern. So uh, I think for all the meta-analyses that have been published until now, we need to correct this. We need to take into account those studies that are adjusting or those that do not have a... I mean, we, we've looked at this for sugar-sweetened beverages and where the adjustment is there, there's an attenuation. Uh, and so that fits with the, I think, the, the assumption that it is on the causal pathway and the energy is actually mediating the association, which the authors of those of those prospective courts themselves admit, that's why it's that's thought to be the main mediator is energy. So it's it's not necessarily the the metabolic effects. I think that's important. Uh, but I just wanted to add, um, you know, I think one way to look address this, and I think what's come out from both of our talks, is that we need to do nonlinear modeling because I think that does capture. Uh, it may not be energy adjusted or unadjusted, but you're getting at least a, 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 the look at the data with at different levels of intake, and what you're seeing is the relationship does change, especially for juices. Okay, uh, please introduce yourself yes, before Yes, I'm ask. Jackie von Kemenad from Holland. I'm a GP, and um, thank you for the presentation. It was great, although it's confusing because I'm not looking with the eye of a scientific uh, a worker, but I'm looking in, uh, as a doctor what I'm going to advise my patients when I see them again next week. And um, when I uh, when I hear this story and I'm listening to the 100% uh, fruit juice story, um, what I'm wondering is, uh, you know, what I'm going, what I'm, wh what advice am I going to give? So. I hear that there's not a linear a curve, so above five we have a problem when you're giving 100% fruit juice. Also, when I'm advising my diabetic patients, 
Uh, sometimes we're not sure what's going to happen if you eat the apple or if you drink the juice. So I recommend them to just me measure their uh, blood sugars one and a half hours after uh, uh, drinking or eating. And I see that with diabetic patients uh, who've been having diabetes for a long time, that their uh, blood sugar can rocket up and we are being very careful with that. Um, and trying to understand it, uh, I discovered another study which I was reading last week about that when you're giving juice or when you're giving the apple, it gives a different response in the GIP and the GLP-1. And the GRP actually skyrockets when giving the apple juice and it's actually kind of stabilized when eating um, the apple itself. So the structure uh, that you're giving your patients in the apple or in the juice or in the added uh, sugar juice has a different effect on your, your gut hormones. And that seems to me make an explanation and I was wondering if you could comment on that and if you could also give me an advice what to advise my patients Monday morning. I'll, I'll tackle the first part because I'm not aware of the GIP data but I think matrix does matter and I think that's very clear from our analyses. Um, but I think, you know, Fred Brune said it well last year, I'm not sure if Fred's here, he's at organizing, but when he gave his talk that, I mean, I think it's like a champagne glass full. So we have to go back to those original servings of fruit juice which were in small little glasses where it's actually a complement to your intake of fruit and vegetables. It's not for hydration. What you're mm -hmm. doing is you're taking it as a, a complement to your intake of fruit. And I think if you think of it that way, it's a lot yeah. easier to with think the about. Fiber. You don't want to hydrate with it, I don't mm. think, because you're not, you may not get the compensation of energy and you then risk over consuming. And when we saw the threshold, it was even as low as about 250 for metabolic syndrome. So, you know, I think 125, 150 mils is where a lot of guidelines have sort of sit on that, which is about a serving or serving a half of actual fruit. So I think that's a, a reasonable sort of serving size, which is those original little orange juice glasses or a champagne glass, if you mm -hmm. like. Thank you. Can you com comment on the gut hormone reaction? Uh, the GIP and the GLP-1. GIP, yes. This could be uh, one of the mechanisms explaining this uh, uh, compensation. Uh, uh, if I remember, there is a crossover study also analyzing this with uh, um, uh, different, with, with liquid uh, formula, uh, with sugar, or uh, solid formula. And also they uh, observe changes on the uh, gut, uh, gut, gut hormone. So this could be one of the explanations, this compensation. Thank you. Thank you. David, wants, David wants to speak. Oh, David, I'm sorry. You're pointing. Yes, just, <laughs> just a quick one for your advice for your patients, I think. Again, we've been talking about the solid versus the liquid, and I think that the solid, the solid apple versus the apple juice is preferable, but if they can't get an apple, then a little apple juice is not a bad thing. Uh, Wendy, please. Thank you. Uh, Wendy Hawkins, College London. Um, I just wondered if the panel were aware of any evidence on smoothies, because they seem to be available much more in shops now, and presumably there's a big consumer demand for smoothies. So here we have, we have the fruit juice, but we also have the fiber. It's no longer intact, whereas in the fruit, a lot is encapsulated within the cell wall. So it's com presumably a completely different metabolic response. Um, do we have much data on it, and do we have any um, recommendations on smoothie intake? Is something new, so uh, in some cases there are uh, some of them that are that they add sugar, and in some cases no. So uh, we do not have uh, any uh, study in relation to this because it is a new type of uh, mm -hmm. consumption of uh, fruit juices. Uh, but there is data, though, that uh, semi-solids, which I think a smoothie would constitute, are better compensated than liquids. So, yeah, there, there is data. Yeah, that's the Dronowski meta-analysis of, of uh, preload studies showed semi-solids were behaved uh, more like solids than liquids. So that would include even yogurts or, or smoothies. So I think based on that, and that's an extrapolation because we don't have a lot of data, I agree. I would say clinically, though, I, I find them a really useful way to get sometimes servings of fruit vegetables, nuts, plant sterols, uh, and fiber uh, into my patients where we're trying to lower their cholesterol and they need to take more viscous fiber. It's a really easy place to put oat fiber or uh, to put uh, psyllium fiber, for example, with your favorite fruit and uh, soy milk. 
Thank you, John. I just want to emphasize what John last said as an almost giveaway, throw away the soy milk. So it is, it is an opportunity. If you're going to enrich it with protein, then you can use some vegetable protein sources such as soy milk to do that. And that would be useful and probably keep the glycemic index lower. Hmm. And presumably the rheology is an important um, component as well because it's more viscous in the smoothie. The viscosity of a smoothie will change. You know, I think the rheology is probably very important. I mean, a lot of books have done a lot of work on rheology of fibers and shown that it relates, as did David a lot, and Tom do a lot of the original work, and, and Jordy showed that even with the, the rheology of those foods. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I would think that the smoothie, it's 100% fruit juice. Uh, it's going to be healthy. I guess the only concern would be the overconsumption, because some of them may come in quite large formats. So that would be my only concern. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Professor, are you one more question? I, I will leave the last question to you. <laughs> Sorry. I had just a comment to the previous discusser. Uh, it is a classical knowledge, and uh, Professor Jenkins is pioneer on that, as well as Otto in Bremen. If you give, uh, for example, applesauce, uh, applesauce, uh, instead of uh, solid apple, there is an enormous difference in blood glucose um, increase. And uh, not only that, but also insulin is uh, very, very high. There was also in Lancet 30 years ago a comparison of uh, solid apple versus uh, uh, versus uh, juice, uh, apple juice. And um, the idea is that uh, in the case of juice, at least in diabetics, you have an increase in um, insulin resistance also. And if we accept the general idea in diabetes that the spikes and not only the whole uh, postprandial increase are very important and perhaps most, uh, more important than the whole surface of the increase, that uh, this is less beneficial, then in that case I would say not at all for diabetics to have uh, fruit drinks, yeah, except if they don't have teeth. Okay. David, do you want to try tackling that one? Glycemic response of uh, fruit juice versus the whole fruit. I just want to say that I think you're certainly right, and Ken Heaton did some very nice, nice work in The Lancet uh, before anyone here was born, um, showing, showing that there was a, a, perhaps the two of us could perhaps be, be, be left alone standing. Um, it, in which he showed that if he transitioned from the same apple to the same apple puree, then to the same fruit juice, you, as you said, you got high rises in glucose insulin and changes in satiety, which are important. But I think I'd, I'd go back to your other point, looking at the glass and what I'm going to call the glass and plastic um, concern. I think that my concern is that the apple is not just an apple. It's got a lot of phenolics in the apple. It's got a lot of antioxidants. It's got C. It's got potassium. It's got magnesium. So that um, you have to weigh that against glycemic index, which I have to say um, may not be the most important thing when you look at all those other associated nutrients. I would agree with you entirely that the preferential thing would be, to, and we're all agreeing, take your fruit but for those, as you say, who haven't teeth, or in a hurry, or in an airport where there isn't an apple, um, what's it better to do? Thank you.